I'm Jenny Williamson. And I'm Jen McMenemy. And we're from Ancient History Fangirl. So you're about to tune into Queen's podcast, and we're here to just give you a heads up. These two swear, like a lot. Like a whole lot? So if that's not your thing, this may not be the podcast for you. But if it is your thing, you're in the right place. And if you like your history tipsy and interspersed with F-bombs, you might like us too. Check out Ancient History Fangirl wherever you get your podcasts. Enjoy the show. Hi, this is Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queen's Podcast, the show about badass women in history. Nathan. Hey, Katie. Happy quarantine day number 700. And 52.3. Yay. Yep. Yep. Have you lost your sanity and run down the street naked yet? <laughs> I feel like I've circled back to normal now. Okay. Okay. You- All the other weeks were like, I'm going slightly mad. And now I've kind of just been like, all right, I don't, I don't see people in person anymore. It's fine. Um, I know, I know. It's weird how it like kind of juggles between the two. Like it's like one day or one week you're completely fine. And then the next week you're like, oh my God, I really just want to go to a fucking salad bar and sit down and eat my weight in leaves. Like I really just want a big salad bar. We are here to talk about the rest of the life of Joan of Navarre. Hootie hoo. Nathan, what are you drinking today? So I just bummed out and I got some Dosa Keys because (laughs) I'm going to have some chicken wings and collard greens. Um, (laughs) It's going to be fabulous. And bitch, I make the best collard greens in the world. Oh, interesting. So anyway. (laughs) Fun fact. Well, I am actually um, doing dry May, which is like dry January. But in May. So I <laughs> I found um, this sparkling water at 7-Eleven that's um, watermelon flavored, but supposed to be CBD infused. So I'm going to give that a try. So let me crack that open. It sounds really good. Yeah, let's see what it tastes like. Ooh, I love the taste. I love watermelon, though. So anyway... Okay, quick (laughs) recap. Um, If you're jumping into this one without listening to the Joan of Navarre part one, you might want to go back and give that a listen. But to recap what we discussed, Joan was the daughter of the King of Navarre, and he was just crazy. Like, I was an idiot. Yeah, yeah, that was an understatement. Yeah. Um, On her mother's side, she was related to the King of France was her first cousin, when she was a teenager, she was married to the Duke of Brittany, who it seems she had a pretty happy relationship with. They had a ton of kids. And then the Duke died, and she was regent of Brittany for a few years, and she was kind of rocking it. But then this bitch went and fell in love. Um, a man that she had previously met <clears throat> when she was just royal Jason in exile was now the fucking king of England. And they're, like, sending some pretty hot and steamy little letters. I mean, even for the time where people kind of wrote more lovingly, they're a little extra. Letters Um, were, like, obviously romantic. Yes. Romantical letters. Romantical. I love it. Mm -hmm. So finally, one day, a royal envoy from England shows up on the shores of Brittany with some, like, really fucking fancy jewels dripping in jewels. Hello, Guanza, honey. Yeah. Um... (laughs) Which is like 15th century version of like, hey, um, the king wants to marry you and bone you, so... Uh... And now you're all caught up on episode one. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah, so she's being asked to become the freaking queen of England, but she's hesitant. <laughs> which sounds, that sounds insane to us, but for her, it was like a really hard decision. Yeah, it's weird that, I don't know, like, why would she be hesitant? to be the fucking queen of England. Like in today's world, I'd, I'd jump to be the queen of England. I mean, I'd have to have a sex change to be queen. Yeah. Um, but but. I, would, I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> that option would be on the table. Well, 
things were a little different for her. First, um, you know, she was the regent of Brittany for her son, who's like 12. And she couldn't be both the Queen of England and the regent of Brittany at the same time. Mm. Um, remember, France and England are in the middle of the Hundred Years' War. Oh, God, that and, thing. <laughs> yes. And Brittany is technically like French lands. And so they were not about to, like, you know, the the people weren't like, in their mind, they're like, well, if you go and marry the King of England, the King of England's now going to be the regent for Brittany. And they weren't into it. So if she was going to become the Queen of England, she would have to give up her regency. Yeah. And, and not only, not only like the, the, just the semantics of everything and the naming and like, you know, sh- let's get like straight to the heart of it. She would have to leave her kids too. Yes. Like yeah. that's the other thing. Like that's that's an emotional thing. Yeah, her eldest son was like already Duke, so he couldn't um, obviously go with her, even though he was still technically a child. And her other kids, she had a child that was one of her daughters was already married off to like a rich like Duke or Count or something, and. Her other two sons, you know, they were in line for the succession, so they had to stay there as well. So she only, out of all her kids, she only brought two of her daughters with her. Um, And also she's leaving. She's been in Brittany. Like, she's, she has roots there. People know Yeah, she feels secure there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she's got, like, all that land. (laughs) She was a really wealthy duchess. Like, the Duke left her like really fucking well set off so she wouldn't have to remarry if she didn't want to yeah um so she's like i don't know like i don't know if i would have done it i may have been like well i'm loved here i have power here i got plenty of money here no nah, bitch i'm fine my, my kids are here <laughs> yeah and why would i want to go to a place where i don't know how people are gonna react to me you know yeah very unknown but it must have been love (laughs) oh my god yes (laughs) they were they just i just really really think that joan and henry i mean there was no other reason for their union besides that they were genuinely in love with each other yeah and he even like didn't expect her to bring a dowry which is like Mm -hmm. fucking huge like because that's 99 percent of the time that's what the marriage was arranged for (laughs) right (laughs) you made these alliances this might become an issue later (laughs) (laughs) in fact like he made sure that she was like set up for her own sources of income once she like got to England. Mm-hmm. So, but all we really need to know right now is that they fucking love each other and they're I'm like head over here. They're crazy right now. Come on, they're crazy right now. Katie, they're crazy musical. in love. They're crazy <laughs> in love is what I'm getting at. So she's made her decision. And like I said, I don't know if it's the decision I would have made, but I've never been, obviously I've never been in the position where the King of England wants to marry me. So um, she's like, okay, I have to give up my spot as the regent of Brittany. But my son, even though 12 years old was the age of majority and he was 12, in all reality, he's not, he, he can't run shit by himself as a 12 year old. No, not. absolutely not. It's going to so be she, some old guy. <laughs> so she goes and puts a listing on indeed.com and mm-hmm. she's like, um, now accepting resumes for Regent of Brittany. Um, must have ties to French royal family, two to five years previ- previous Regency experience. Please include a cover letter and three references. <laughs> Indeed.com. <laughs> Yield. Indeed.com. Uh, no, but really, the choice really wasn't that tough. Her uncle, the Duke of Burgundy, was super obvious. He had been the regent for his nephew, the King of France, so he was already respected in the world of dudes. Yeah. And, and he'd been really good to Joan when she was young, and obviously being held a friendly hostage by him so huh, yeah yeah 
Um, I read two different accounts on this. Um, I read that she like reached out to the Duke of Burgundy and like was like, hey, this is what's going on. I want you to be regent. And then I also read that the Duke of Burgundy found out she was talking to the King of England about getting married and he took her to court and was like, you have to hand over your lands, basically. Like took her to like like manhandled it from her. So I don't know which one is true, but either way, it all ended up the same. And um, it doesn't seem like she put up any fight in letting the Duke of Burgundy now become the regent for her son. So while they're working out all the kinks in that, um, in 1402, her and Henry write a letter to the Pope, uh, and they're asking for a papal dispensation. (laughs) Honestly, when it comes to, like, having to get this papal dispensation... They really aren't as related as yeah, they're not. a lot of our other queens have been related to their husbands. <laughs> I think they're like, um, they were, the reason they were considered too closely related, I believe, because these family trees are confusing because they are a circle. Um, but I believe she was actually, they were like second cousins through her dead husband. But in the eyes of the church, that's your family just as much as if you were blood related. Oh, so they really weren't even related. I think they were actually related because everyone's related in the <laughs> royal. <laughs> I mean, it's true. It's true. They're all. But they were of... like they were maybe like fifth cousins, but her, him, and her ex husband her dead husband, were like second cousins or something like that. So, but, moral uh, of the story: the Pope approves it. <laughs> pope did not say nope. There were. This is, we're not going to go into it because I don't understand it. There were two popes at the time. One was called the Pope in Rome and the other was called the Anti-Pope. So wait. Which I think it's like Mario and Wario. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Totally. Totally. Like, did the the Pope, did the Anti-Pope call themselves an Anti-Pope? Or did they say that they were the Pope and the other Pope was always the anti No, so there was, like, the Pope in Rome, and then there was, like, another Pope, and he was the anti-Pope. I don't know (laughs) if they used the phrase anti- It doesn't matter. I don't understand it, and we're gonna move on. Crazy, crazy Catholicism at the time. But there were (laughs) two Popes, and each of them wrote- Each of them wrote to a separate Pope. Joan got the approval from- the regular pope and so before the other pope had a chance to respond and so they just went good enough for us so so confused it was like england supported one pope and france supported another pope it doesn't matter there's just drama just drama (laughs) too many too many popes in the kitchen (laughs) so they prepared the marriage contract and she's like packing her bags. Her bags are packed and she's ready to go. She's got her passport on the road. Um, and she's ready to head off to fucking England to like marry for love. <laughs> How many? We just really haven't had that many queens that we've discussed that married for like actual, just like I'm. Yeah, we've, I think we've talked about mistresses and things like that that were yeah. in love with their kings and, you know, kings were head over heels, but not queens. Queens. I mean, I think Elizabeth Woodville may be an exception. Yeah, Elizabeth Woodville, what they married for love. And I think um Theodora yes. and Justine were I actually. I really think that's love. like it. <laughs> yeah. I think Mary Queen of Scots married <laughs> her first husband for love and then real quickly went, Oh no, control Z. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so- Anyway, so she gets this text from her cousin, you know, Joan, that is. And the King of France is, like, pissed. Like, I mean, the King of France pissed. has the right to be pissed. Also, the King of France wasn't necessarily lucid at this time, so it may have been his people. But they're like, hey, you're going to marry the dude that almost definitely murdered our son-in-law right and she was just like new phone <laughs> so, i know like she how do you, what that, it just it's gonna make i can see reunions awkward as real fun. fucking awkward yeah yeah real fucking awkward <laughs> so 
the day comes and Joan and her daughters and this big ass crew of Bretons set sail for England. And Henry had also sent two of his half brothers to like escort her back. Yes. And these brothers' last names were Beaufort, which probably rings a bell to some people. Yeah, if you're a <laughs> War of the Roses fan, you probably know the last name Beaufort. Anyway. And they leave the day after Christmas, 1402, and set sail for England. Boxing uh, Day for my UK friends. What is Boxing Day? It's the day after Christmas. It's a holiday in the UK. What it, is it putting away all the boxes? <laughs> I don't know why it's called Boxing Day. Do people like punch each other? No, I don't what? think it has anything to do with like the sport okay. of boxing. Okay. <laughs> but I don't know why it's called Boxing Day. So anyway, they are on the ship to England. And they left from, um, like, a port in Brittany, and they were supposed to be landing in a port in southern England that should have taken, like, a week and a half. It took them, like, 23 days. What the fuck? Yeah. Like, um, I, it's hard. I put it in Google Maps. It's hard to decide exactly how long it should have taken, but 23 days was way too long. It's because they hit um, a storm and got blown way off track. And it just sounds, I freak out when we hit a little bit of turbulence on an airplane. I cannot imagine being on a ship where it's like, all right, we could legit like capsize you know like so I, that just sounds really so scary to me yeah it doesn't sound fun to me either lots of anxiety feeling my Lots blood of right anxiety now. Yes. <laughs> so she landed in a place called falmouth and um i popped that in to google maps and like compared it to where she was supposed to land and it's like not really close to each other. So they got blown real far off track and like found their oh, way wow. back. To, and then they just ended up being like, it's land. We think it's England. Let's just stop there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Henry is like chilling near where she's supposed to land. And I imagine, cause you know, they don't have like, how are they supposed to communicate with each other? He's expecting her like two weeks ago. He doesn't know. Like, are they dead? Uh- so he gets word that, Hey, they landed. Like, can you just imagine the anxiety of just sitting there being like, I can just imagine what's going through your head. Like, has she decided she didn't want to come? You know, are they dead? Yeah. Did they drown? Did pirates take them? Did the French people kill her? Yeah. Did they be like, <laughs> no, you're not going to marry the English off with your head. But so he gets word that she's landed and um, he's like a two day ride away. And he immediately just hops on his horse and he's like, Aww. I know. And he's like, I'm going to go meet up with her. Sorry, bye. Yeah. And finally, like a month after she departed from Brittany, she and Henry finally lay eyes on each other. And bitch, it was fireworks. Yeah, that was Katie Yes. That was Katie So we don't, they had been married by proxy previously. So I don't know what the rules about sex were in between like, could you have sex at the time in between, like, your marriage by proxy and your actual marriage? I would. Day? I'm a slut, and I would say yes. Oh, well, no. Like, obviously, modernized <laughs> would be like, well, yeah, if you're already legally married, of course. But yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I couldn't, believe it or not, Googling, can you have sex, marriage by proxy, didn't come up with a whole lot. So I <laughs> I, I mean, I I don't see, even in the modern day, I don't see why not. Maybe because, because... they hadn't, like, taken the sacraments together, like, in a church. Uh, the only thing right. I'm thinking, maybe not. But anyway, right. I hope they, like, they had, like, their actual, like, church wedding, like, a week later. But I hope they got to bone in, in the intermittent, just because they were so hot and heavy for each other. You know? uh, yeah. Makes sense, makes sense, makes sense. But after a week and a half later, they finally fucking have their wedding. 
And so on February 7th, 1403, Joan marries Henry IV, King of England, and she's around 34 years old, and he's 36, which... So they're like the same age. That feels so great. So we, 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 yeah, we don't have a creepy story on our hands. Yes. They are, (laughs) they are like almost the same age. Her old husband had been like 30 years older than her. It must be nice to like have a man in your bed that's like... At the same pace as you, you know? exactly. Everyone who's anyone in the English court was invited to this wedding. And it was a fucking party. Drinking and dancing and feasting. And it cost a pretty penny. And England is kind of broke right now. (laughs) They're like, please don't. Please don't. They're like, eh, we're going to do it anyway. I didn't bother writing down the amounts that I read because, like, I don't know what the conversion rate is. Yeah. But it was like, the wedding costs, like, this much. And that's not including how much it costs to, you know, get her to England in the first place and then get her to the chapel and stuff like that. So that just, but that just led me to, like, even though I couldn't wrap my head around what those costs meant in modern day money, if that many people were writing it down and being like, and that's not including this, that's not including that. I think that means like the entire country was being like, why is he spending so much money on this woman? You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was obvious. Yeah. So none of Joan's family is there because baby, they got bad blood. Yeah. Oh my God. I just did it. Her Her daughters that she brought with her to England would have been there. We just referenced T-Swift, everybody. Oh my God. Oh, but they it's very fitting. Like, her family, <laughs> married family and her family family had bad blood. Um, Her brother, who's the king of Navarre, though, did, like, write to their French relatives. And was like, hey, Henry's cool. Y'all need to, like, put the past behind you. So Okay, at least, it, at least it's a step in the right direction. So maybe the family reunion isn't quite as awkward. It's still awkward. A couple of weeks later, Joan made her official arrival into London and was like, fucking crown the Queen of England. <laughs> she got to hold that. <laughs> yeah. that. She got to hold that stick thingy and that spear thingy, which Well, it's noteworthy because the stick and the sphere thing, like usually a consort, a queen, only held one or the other. And like he Henry was like, no, she needs to hold both. So, like, Ooh, it was like... she bougie. She a bougie-ass hoe. <laughs> yes. Precisely. <laughs> that is how she is notated in all the history books. <laughs> <laughs> on her day, on her coronation day, um, <clears throat> the chroniclers wrote that she was beautiful, but snobby. So, Ooh, so they're mating. There's yeah. that bad blood. <laughs> she... She did not immediately click with the English people. She had brought in a big crew from her homeland over. And she was really only interested in socializing with them. Which, I, if that, if that is true from what the chroniclers say, that's kind of bitchy of her. Come on. like you're Yeah, gonna- that's not really cool. I mean, maybe... Maybe she's just not socially ept as everybody else, but at the same point, you're trying to vie for the Queen of England. You need to reach out to the English. Or, <laughs> or maybe people are just looking for reasons to not like her because you can't shit talk the king, but you can shit talk the queen. Hmm. You mean to tell me, Katie, that women get a bad reputation? Because people are unhappy with their husbands. Yes! Yes! <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> this has happened in history once or twice before. Oh my god, you mean people can't blame the king so the queen gets all the shit? Ah, yes. That must, that must suck. <laughs> this is completely new, brand new information that we've never discussed before. No, this happens all the fucking time. People are pissed <laughs> off at the king. So they take it off take it out on the queen because you can't shit talk the king it's so yeah it's, like, it's not it's not henry's fault that the wedding costs so much it's, it's her fault her fault that she he asked her to marry him and come to england right? it's her fault. 
<laughs> and it's her fault that he threw her an expensive coronation. And it's her fault that, you know, like, it's just so stupid. Henry, like we mentioned this in the last episode, Henry basically usurped the crown mm-hmm. and took took the kingship for himself from his cousin. And so there had been a lot of uprisings. Yeah. So a strategic marriage that brought him a lot of um, foreign allies and a lot of money would have been much preferred by everybody else in the country. But that's not what he did. He was in love. He married a woman that he loved that did not bring him any allies and did not bring him any money because he's thinking with his heart, not his brain. And so the entire country is pissed off at him for marrying for love. But like we said, you can't walk around being like, with the dumbass, like fucking king married some chick that's not going to bring us any money when we're broke. You can't say that. So yeah. yeah. So everyone's like, well, she's a snob, you know? Yeah. So that's just that's just me putting my educated guess on the situation. And I think it's a pretty good educated guess because Joan didn't come with any alliances. If Mm-mm. anything, it really pissed off like their most powerful enemy in the world, France. Yeah. She wasn't, she had a whole lot of money tied up in Brittany, but she wasn't allowed to bring it over to England. Mm -hmm. Henry ended up just setting Joan up with, you know, all this land and income. And it turned out to actually be like the largest annual income an English queen had ever had in history, ever in England. I know, it's crazy. Like, I mean, kings would always set their queens up to be like, okay, if I die, I want to make sure you have some income. But Henry just went, balls to the wall <laughs> like yeah, yeah. He, he gave her so much income and then again so everyone's like can you believe the king was so foolish to give her so much money so instead they're just calling her a gold digger and stuff yep sounds sounds uh sounds like she's pretty unpopular in her first couple of years as queen <laughs> it's so dumb because when everyone's like she's just coming over here marrying the king being a gold digger it's like y'all she didn't need his money no, she, had she had didn't. Her own money. She left a cush life. I don't believe for a second that she was a gold digger. Oh no, absolutely not. I ain't saying she's a gold digger. Period. <laughs> Period. Because I'm not. <laughs> I'm not repeating the rest of the words. <laughs> well, and also, she's just not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, period. So Parliament ends up telling the king, "Look, okay, we'll pay for your wife, bougie ass hoe, mm-hmm. but her crew has got to go." That was their campaign slogan. Yeah. Um, and Henry knew, like, okay, this is really going to piss Joan off, but I have to make some sort of concessions with the people because they're, like, ready to revolt against me. So I might need to back down on a couple of things. Yeah. So jo- Joan had to dismiss, dismiss, like, all of her staff from Brittany. Ex- like, obviously her daughters could stay. And then, like, I think I think it was, like, 13 like of her staff could stay, but that's like from a group of like 80 people or something that she had brought over with her. Um, in the end. Oh, of wow. To stay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this was kind of a turning point for Joan where she started to try to start seeing herself as being an English lady. You know, she started yeah. to kind of realize, okay, I need to make some major adjustments. This was her revamping her image. <laughs> yes. And the next couple of years, her reputation was on the up and up. Um, in 1403, she did have a miscarriage. Um, she was carrying twins and both of the chil- both of the babies died. And her and Henry never had any more children together. Yeah. And that's what I found really weird, too. It's like why but there are really there's a lot of different views on what happened as to why they didn't have any other kids yeah one is that like she had a miscarriage and physically cannot have another child which biologically makes sense yeah <laughs> and the other is that after this joan and henry looked at each other and were like do we really need any more children? Did we, they didn't. They both had plenty of children and having kids together wouldn't be like, wouldn't 
it didn't make any sense for them to I try think, proactively. I think it would have added to the drama because, like, we talked about in our Eleanor of Aquitaine episode, when you have too many sons around, exactly. they're each vying for the throne and they're all fighting each other, trying to kill each other with all these supporters. So there is that side of the argument to say they're like, eh, maybe we've got our heir and a spare and a spare and a spare. We're good. Like, yeah. no reason to. And also, um, Henry's first wife died in childbirth. So maybe he was scarred. It was. It's also completely possible after like this like difficult thing where she had the miscarriage. He was just like, nope, nope, we're not doing this anymore. So I don't know. There's nothing to imply that they didn't have sex anymore. So I don't know. Maybe they just used the pull-out method and it worked for them. I don't know. <laughs> but they didn't have any more they didn't have any more babies and nobody seemed to be grieved by this. It seemed yeah. to be fine with everybody. So sadly for Joan, a couple of years later, her daughters that had been with her in England were called back to Brittany. Um, their brother, who, you know, had all this land and money, was ready to marry them off for alliances, as you do, yeah. you know, because women are bargaining chips. And her daughters were 14 and 18, so it's not like they were... She, she saw this coming. Like, she that's, was old. Coming. that's old for this time period. 14 was about average. 14 was about average. And 18, they were actually married in like a double ceremony. They were married on the same day to two like different powerful dudes, like at the, like a, so like it was like a whole alliance thing between Brittany. Well, look, there you go. They saved money by having just one wedding. Yes, exactly. I mean, one wedding, one reception. I mean, mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. They had. (laughs) had to be expecting that for a long time but still it was probably like a bummer to see her daughters go yeah but joan ended up developing a really good relationship with her stepson which i found really kind of refreshing right yeah i thought that was really cool that she did that and namely it was the heir to the throne her stepson henry yeah Um, she developed a good relationship with all of henry's mm -hmm. children the the prince of wales the future henry v was the one that she really clicked with the best, which is good for her husband because the two of them, Henry the fourth and Henry the fifth did not always have like a friendly relationship. Mm -hmm. So to have Joan like step in and try to be like a bandaid on that was, was really great on her part. You know, she didn't, she wanted to be a peacekeeper in the family, you know? Yeah, and it makes her look really good because that's not her son, and she's at the same point able to rein him in, if you will, and earn his respect. So I think yeah. that probably from the English people's standpoint, it's like she's keeping the peace, and yes. that's keeping us from killing each other. So more power to you, Joan. Yes. <laughs> she would often publicly take the Prince of Wales, like the younger Henry's side over her husband's side, which I feel like when they were in private, she would like probably tell her husband, Hey, I'm going to do this because, because like, obviously if you're, I think rule number one of marriage is don't take somebody else's side in front of your spouse, like in yeah. front of the group. So she was probably like, look, I'm going to do this because We've talked about how queens would like beg for mercy and like yeah. everything. Yeah. That was her way of doing this. Like, I'm going to publicly take your son's side so that you can like do like reluctantly take his side as well and cause peace in the rain. So yeah, it, it endeared the court to her. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, like I was mentioning earlier, sons and kings and usually don't get along. Um, there's a lot of fighting. Yeah, not always, you know, 50-50. Sometimes they're just really, they're cool with each other. And then other times it's like, they just want to overthrow them. Well, we've seen, (laughs) we've talked about that. And it feels like so specifically in England that kept happening. We talked about that in the Eleanor of Aquitaine episode. We talked about that in the Matilda of Flanders episode, where like sons are trying to overthrow their old dad as king um yeah joan did a real good part of just like keeping the peace there Mm -hmm. sadly though during the first year of their marriage there was like a really really significant uprising oh yeah 
And Henry went off to fight along with his son, Henry. Um, So this uprising was happening on two fronts. One was happening up in Northumberland, which is like north of England or like northern England. And another part was happening in Wales. Like the uprising was coming at them from both ends. So it took a lot of Henry's time and attention away from her. And it all kind of came to a head in a battle called the Battle of Shrewsbury, which is a pretty famous battle. We won't go into it in detail because Joan wasn't there. It was a big fucking deal. Henry won, which was also a big fucking deal because he was fighting the battle on two fronts. Yeah. Awesome. But can you just imagine Joan sitting at home? It's not like, I just imagine she must have just been like knots in her stomach this whole time because it's like. Oh, I, she's not new to this party. Well, no, but she's like, she's not, she's not an established queen. Like she's only been queen for like a year. She's yeah, not like true. someone that's beloved by the people. Yeah. She's I mean, they, like, they think that she's a fucking gold digger. She doesn't have any allies that are going to come save her. You know, France mm-hmm. is pissed off at her. So if her husband loses and is killed in battle, what is going to happen to me? Uh, probably going to be killed too. Um, never know. Never so know. I imagine she's just sitting at home praying so hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Doomsday just... scenario is running all in her head. Hard saying. Hard saying. Oh Joan. my I'm God. I'm feeling the just, same way. I, I just have to imagine her mind went to some bleak places. Oh, fuck yeah. Life. But Henry and his team ended up winning in the end. So young Henry, the Prince of Wales, was fucking shot in the face with an arrow. In the face. In the the face with an arrow. In the middle ages. In the face. He survived. Ah. Ah. Uh, I went down. Oh. I went down this rabbit hole because, like, the um, journals of the doctor who removed the arrow from his face survive. I went down the most gruesome little rabbit hole about this shit. Ooh. <laughs> about, like, because he wrote down, like, his whole technique on how he removed it and what he did and, like, what he did first and what he did next. And I I'm like- actually kind of interested, and I know a lot of people would be disgusted by this, but I'm one of those weirdos that kind of, like, is, like, ooh, I want to know more. I, can't, I didn't write down the name of the doctor on in our notes here, but it's it was super easy for me to find via Google. If you just Google like Henry V shot in the face, doctor, you'll find it. <laughs> I because I'm just reading this being like this man had this extracted. It hit him um, under like in between the space between your eye and the bridge of your nose. And okay, and exited the arrow, out the bottom. The arrow, like went in, in, and the doctor removed it without any like modern day painkillers. Oh, like I'm sorry, I- I'm speaking in tongues, guys. I'm exactly. Tongues. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I couldn't even imagine a tooth extraction without painkillers. <laughs> oh, oh <Stomach>. no. <laughs> anyway. Henry comes home from this more than a little bit bitter. Like, y'all need to stop revolting against me. Y'all need to get fucking used to this. I am the goddamn king. And so he decides to make some pretty high-profile executions without a trial by jury. If Joan did any of that, you know, like chivalrous, like, show the mercy queen thing, it was hard and ignored and it's not yeah, documented. Well, she's fucking pissed the fuck off. I mean, she I don't was think really she fucking... I don't think, yeah. I don't she think was... she begged mercy for these men at all. No, she was clutching her pearls or her rosary beads, praying to baby Jesus, trying not to kill her yes. after this whole... She she ain't gonna care about them in no mo. <laughs> Henry had an archbishop, the archbishop of York, executed. Ooh, that's always that's always a bad PR move. Anytime you execute, yeah. It was a bad PR move. And such a high profile. Yeah. Because archbishops are like, what? They're like princes of the church, basically. Yeah, they are are way up there. You know, they are. 
he was excommunicated by the Pope for a couple of years as a result of it. But it was it was a power move. It was basically to be like, you think I'm scared of y'all? <laughs> you think I'm scared yeah. of y'all? I'm going to have this guy, I'm going to have this guy who is protected by the fucking Pope executed without a trial. And then y'all come to me acting like I'm scared of y'all. No. Yeah, it was, this was a, it was a pissing contest for sure. Um, and it appears that Joan, through all of this, ended up supporting him, you know, because like killing an archbishop was a big deal. And, you know, for such a religious society, they're all like, what the fuck are you doing? She was sitting there being like, hey, I was fucking scared shitless, too. I thought y'all were coming for me, too. Yeah. Do what you got to do, baby. Baby, you do what you got to do to prove that you're the king. I'm what was it that Chris Jenner <laughs> taking the picture? I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I'm, you're doing great, sweetie. <laughs> yeah. She was just like, you're doing great, sweetie. This is, you're doing fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so this whole uprising thing has been going on for like two fucking years. And though they stayed in contact and like saw each other when they could, um, the first two years of their marriage were pretty rough. Yeah. Um, so Henry writes home and is like, I'm on my way to see you, baby girl. And except a few days later, or a few days after the execution of the Archbishop, Henry, like, got really fucking sick. Mm -hmm. um, it was, like, this first big bout of illness while he was, like, on his way home. Um, in the middle of the night, he just, like, sat up and was screaming like he was on fire or some shit. That's what he said. He, like, told his men. He was like, I'm on fire. And they're like, sir, you are not. And he was like. I am on fire. And they're like, no, you're not. But it's just, he, he started to develop this skin condition, which still to this day, you know, baffles historians as to exactly what it was. But yeah, he felt like his skin was burning and Ooh. they went and like touched him and they were like, fuck, it does feel like his skin is burning. He was so fucking sick. So <laughs> what was it? We don't know. The most popular view right now is some kind of like extreme, extreme, extreme um, psoriasis that maybe, like possibly maybe. even caused him to have a heart attack that night as well. Oh. Some people also think it might have been two illnesses, psoriasis, maybe either also mixed with syphilis or something else. Syphilis. And they like, and they just hit syphilis. Syphilis. And they, just, <laughs> they just hit at the same fucking time to just cause like the perfect storm of. But, I mean, you know? but I mean, they, Joan and him boned. So presumably if she, she would have had syphilis. syphilis. If she had syphilis, it has not survived, you know, like, there's no reason for us to believe she had syphilis. So I, I don't know enough about syphilis to be like, to know if like, maybe it lays dormant in some people or something. I don't fucking know. But. Yeah, there was, not, a, there was like a rumor at the time, though, because at the time, you know, there's all these tensions between like the archbishop and the pope. So the rumor at the time was is that God had stricken him with leprosy. Yes. Because of executing this archbishop, which is pretty unlikely. He, you know? he almost certainly didn't have leprosy, but the um, stigma and the rumor that he had leprosy like was common opinion up until like the 1800s. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That God struck him with leprosy. So... Yeah. Joan, of course, is distraught, so she rushes to go see him, and they're reunited, and from the descriptions of how he looked, it's kind of fucking gross. I mean, I read that, like, the flesh was rotting off of him. I mean, that sounds like leprosy. I know, <laughs> but... Uh, I, it sounds yeah, like leprosy. <laughs> it, but it was gross. Joan is just like, baby, I am here for you. And I'm going, and they were together continuously for the rest of his life, which back then, I mean, now you're like, of course, a spouse is going to be with their sick spouse. But back then, that wasn't a given because relationships weren't necessarily a love match. Mm -hmm. Like, it would be very common for a queen to be like, okay, I'm going to come visit you, but I'm 
also gonna go like visit my other estates or whatever Mm -hmm. but since they were a love match she was by his side for the rest of his life so the next eight years were a roller coaster of the same handful of events Mm -hmm. henry gets really sick parliament thinks that he's about to die and it's like well maybe your son should take over some of the knightly duties or kingly duties and henry of course gets offended and pissed but it's like okay you're right fine he gets better and then is all of a sudden mad at prince henry for like being so eager to take on the kingly duties it, it's and then petty repeat. it's petty <laughs> the next eight years like it's that's on so petty <laughs> on repeat for eight years king gets sick king gets better king and prince fight king gets sick king gets better <laughs> like it goes on uh. for really yeah and but then finally in 1403 10 years after they got married, King Henry IV died. He was only about 46 years old. That's really young. Um, I mean, today it's really young. Back then, <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, that, I think that would be still, you know, especially for a king, maybe that's like, eh, he was, he it's still a had a few good older, years left in him. It's a lot older than most people expected him to live to after no. his first um, bout of leprosy. Of, leprosy. <laughs> yeah of whatever yeah so her stepson at this point henry obviously becomes king henry v and at first joan is like treated like queen mother oh my God. loved he, respected he puts her up on this pedestal since um henry v isn't married yet joan is still the highest ranking woman in the world or in the in, in the world in the country in the world uh, in the world and um though he does take back like some of the lands that she had been given in her husband's will king henry v does take back um i read this one book it's called the red roses blanche of gaunt to margaret beaufort by amy license and Mm. she says king henry would take with one hand but give with another which meant he'd be like okay so i need these lands i need these lands and i need these lands back but you're going to be given the most beautiful gowns of anybody in the country and she Um, so he's like take away some things but then give her these huge concessions and but all in all she's like living a really cush life i do believe she mourned for her husband very deeply well absolutely but she's but she has to put on a brave face because it's only the second king in this dynasty it's a little shaky you know real quick i do think it's noteworthy though that she didn't go home to Brittany with the rest of her children she stayed in england so i think that shows that she at this point, she was loved by the people, and she had developed such a positive yeah. relationship with her stepchildren. Yeah, that is noteworthy. But then there was the year that everything fucking changed. Yes. 2020. I mean, 1415. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we've discussed this in, I believe, a couple of our episodes. Uh, this is the year in French and English history uh, where there was the Battle of Agincourt. So when Henry V was leaving for France with his big ass army, they had this ceremonial thingy-mabob where the king asked for the queen's blessing. So Henry V, not married yet. So Joan, technically, is the highest ranking woman in the country. So she has to take part and give her blessing for him to go into battle, which I think she may have had a little bit of mixed emotions about right uh, because she's half french and yeah so of the people and um i am not a hundred percent sure i read mixed things as well um but i think also her brother in navarre um had si- had like ended up siding with his french relatives as well and was fighting on the french side in this battle as well so she's basically like yeah go off and fight my family <laughs> right but like <laughs> what is she supposed to do you know like yeah. the, she's doing just doing what was expected of her but it must have just been like oh anxiety you know yeah so let's hit the fast forward button and oh. forth through all the battle <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
That's, that's yep. fast forwarding. I, also <laughs> did the, I did the arms with it, like I was running fast. <laughs> so, oh, mm -hmm. um, England wins the battle fucking big time. And it was and, like unexpected. No one yeah. expected. England was outnumbered. They were on like foreign terrain. No one expected them to win, but they did bigly. So did any of like Joan's relatives get killed? Her um her brother. Okay. Her brother who the King of Navarre died, um, I believe. Her um her eldest daughter's husband was killed. Um, and her son Arthur was wounded and taken hostage by the English and brought That's to real awkward. Taking your own son hostage. Um, I mean, it must, on one hand, it's a relief that, oh my God, he's alive. But on the other hand, like to see your son being held prisoner, she went and like begged, like, let my son, his name was Arthur. She was like, let Arthur come live with me. I'll keep him prisoner with me. I'll keep an eye on him. Henry was like, well, no. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> No, because you're his mother and you're going to, you could start an uprising, even yeah, though Rob, she probably wouldn't have, that the possibility is I there. I don't think she, or like he thought like you're going to try to like get his release or something. Like you're going to try to like. Sneak him, him out. Yeah. And it caused a riff between stepmom and stepson so bad. He was just sort of like. Like, I feel like Henry V did come to see Joan of Navarre as a mother figure. And it was almost sort of like, well, why do you love this guy so much? And she's like, because he's my son. And he was, and Henry was like, no, I'm your son. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it, yeah. just, it just butt hurt him so bad. Like, um, I'm sure it's much more nuanced than that. But I feel like that obviously didn't help anything that he was mm -hmm. like, no, you're my mom. Kind of, you know, like when you see your best friend tag somebody else on Instagram, hashtag BFF, and you're like, well, you know, you're my BFF. <laughs> <laughs> so basically so, like that. <laughs> yeah. And Arthur, Arthur himself, he was held prisoner for like five fucking years. So yeah. it was no like little short stint in a jail. No, it yeah. was, it was a, lot, oh, a while. Um, so this obviously rubbed Henry the wrong way. They have arguments and He's like looking around and he's thinking she is siding with my enemies kind of sort of i mean she's really rich off of the money that comes from all these lands i could use some of that money hmm how do i get rid of a powerful woman's money she's a witch whoa whoa <laughs> that escalated quickly <laughs> Well, I mean, it, that's the only plausible that, explanation of why she has so much money and power is she's, she's a witch, worshiping yeah. Satan. So Henry's got this new wife coming up. Like he's trying to negotiate with him marrying a French princess. But the French princess is going to be a whole lot of money, money. And mm -hmm. he doesn't have a whole lot of money, money. Joan has a whole lot of money, money. And he's just like, I, I'm annoyed with her. I need that money. I'm, I need a reason. I need a reason to take it from her that no one is going to question me about. The witch you is know? the perfect fucking mechanism. And Henry V is a dramatic character. This <laughs> guy is drama. And he's all about bold statements and actions and this is a bold statement and action declaring that a queen um dowager is practicing witchcraft against you they say yeah. what they say what they end up saying is that um jones joan told her confessor that she was like wanting henry to die and practicing spells against him and stuff like that and um so they basically what? got uh they 
coerced a priest to lie basically yes <laughs> and also because i i've never been to confession i'm not catholic um but isn't that supposed to be the things you tell your confessor secret secret i got a secret yeah you know, you're not you know? supposed to they're not supposed to say anything and so it his, her confessor was almost definitely um if not tortured like um given the threat of torture you know like you need or to paid tell very well <laughs> no not paid very well because he went to prison too. oh wow that's so <laughs> fucked up I know. <laughs> torture torture a priest to get a confession and put him in jail the poor fucking man of god <laughs> so i went down i didn't put it in the notes but also that confessor may have done some other shit that he deserved to be in jail for so. oh okay but, okay never mind i recant my statement <laughs> <laughs> but maybe not maybe that was a smear campaign but what we do know is october 1st 1419 troops march up to joan's house and they're like you're under arrest for plotting the death of the king via witchcraft <laughs> All right, so, like, I'm laughing, but this would be really scary if you were Joan. Like, witchcraft was not a thing to be taken lightly back then. I mean, oh, we've no. covered this before. Oh, we've no, just this. a few years later, Joan of Arc was literally burnt at the stake for it. Like, yeah, this, this was a time when people legitimately believed, like, if our crops are failing, maybe somebody's doing some witchcraft to us. Like, people were, like actually like killed and tortured and the vast majority of people that were prosecuted for witchcraft were independent women yeah. like it's so gross like first of all on the witchcraft scale only 15 percent of the people um persecuted for witchcraft were men so it's almost exclusively women. Wow. And then in that group of people that were um, accused of witchcraft, that during this time period, women who were independent of men, like it was some weird phenomenon there during this time period, an independent woman was so much more likely. Because it's just, you know, bag of dicks, the patriarchy, they're like, why is she powerful on her own? It must be witchcraft, you know? And it was... Yeah, and was also, when you accuse her of witchcraft, you get to seize some of her lands and money as well. So it's a means in a way... Bingo! To, <laughs> Bingo! It's a means in a way to accuse someone who may appear as a threat to you and then get them killed and inherit their money. I mean, yes. it's a genius way for misogyny just to lay it on thick. So let's be perfectly clear. At no point did Henry V think that his stepmother was a witch. No. At no point. At no point did he actually think she used witchcraft in any way, shape, or form. He just wanted a way to take her money, seize her lands, seize all her money in a way that no one would question. After the first month or so of her being... Um, quote unquote imprisoned, which we'll get to in a minute. Everybody in everybody in power realized the same thing. Of like, oh, mm. oh, he just wanted, he just. Wanted. Oh, okay, so we're not really moving forward with this trial, or she was she. He had no <laughs> plans to put her on trial. That it's just, it was such a farce. It's yeah, ridiculous, just... but it was just yeah, it is what it was. But he wanted her money. He wanted all of her lands. And that was the easiest way for him to imprison her. So let's talk about her imprisonment. Yeah, her life in quote unquote prison at Leeds Castle. <laughs> Castle. Which, it's not really prison. Um, she couldn't leave. So there's that. But she could really do whatever, get visitors whenever she wanted. She could do whatever she wanted. And like, this is, we've talked about other um, queens that have been imprisoned, like... Um, Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary, Queen of Scots, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Iggy of Denmark. Iggy these, Azalea. Yes. But <laughs> this was a whole different level of, like, LOL. Like, um, 
you know, because with even with the most cush of the queens in prison that we've discussed, like Eleanor of Aquitaine, where she was still like living in palaces and still had servants and stuff like that. Her letters were monitored. Her visit, she couldn't have visitors. The only rule that Joan had was you can't leave. She had visitors. She held banquets. She got bored one day and ordered like the equivalent of like a million dollars in fabric to have new dresses done. Oh, so she did, she did basically the equivalent of what I'm doing now with my Amazon purchases in quarantine. Yes. She went crazy on Amazon prime (laughs) y'all. Delivery, (laughs) delivery, delivery every day, knocking on the door, leave it at the doorstep. Don't bother me. (laughs) She'd go horseback riding. She there's even some people think she took a lover. Because this one guy came and stayed for like six months. Huh. Sounds like it. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they were friends. I don't know. But like when you look at the people that she entertained, like and her visitors that she had, she had archbishops come and stay with her. Yeah. She had dukes come and stay with her. If she was actually, if anybody in the world actually thought that she was practicing witchcraft, archbishops wouldn't be coming and having dinner with her you know yeah i think that she really liked to have her freedom you know and well yeah she she would have preferred to have been able to go where she wanted but but i mean this isn't too shabby i mean it's not horrible i mean like i guess she had that hanging over her head the whole time of like oh maybe we'll put you on trial for witchcraft like so she didn't try to like step out of line no i wonder I wonder if she, her and, we don't know, maybe her and Henry talked about it. Maybe he wrote her a letter being like, hey, I'm having to do this for X, Y, Z reasons. We, I, I would be surprised. Know. I mean, that, that honestly, you know, yeah. makes sense to me. I don't know. This I found really interesting. Her son, the Duke of Brittany, did like at first send an envoy to try to get her out of prison. But instead, Brittany and England ended up signing a treaty of eternal friendship. <laughs> What? (laughs) They just dropped the whole get my mom out of prison thing. So there must have been some kind of agreement of like, look, we're not going to hurt your mom. She's fine. Oh my God. A treaty of of eternal friendship. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's all a bunch of lies, France. (laughs) Or Bedford. Anyway, just as suddenly as she had been imprisoned in 1422, she was released. Nice. Like, like, so she had been in prison for about three years. Again, quote unquote prison for about three years in her castle. And then in 1422, Henry V is on his deathbed. And um, he calls his stepmother to his bedside. And the conversation, we have to assume, went something like this. Are you ready for some Queen's Podcast Theater? Queen's Podcast Theater. <laughs> I will be playing the part of Henry V. And I will be Joan of Navarre. Hey, we cool, right? I mean, you did accuse me of witchcraft, and this is the Middle Ages. Let's just not, let's just put, let's just put that all aside. Mm -hmm. How about I give you, like, all of your money back, and also you're free! Alright, cool, I'm over it. A pause, a pause. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so it, like, they just acted like it never happened, and then Henry V died. And and Joan is given almost all of her lands and money back. So she's 54 years old. She's not trying to get married again. Um, but also, she's not trying to be no nun in a fucking convent like some of any other of them. A lot of... Um, wealthy and important widows from the time after their like husbands and sons or whatever died they would become nuns but she was like no i'm just gonna set up my own court over in my own castle and she more or less kind of like disappears from court records except for like big things like baptisms and stuff like that you know yeah she kind of just fell off the radar didn't really participate in politics again which is probably because of the whole witchcraft thing maybe left a bad taste in her mouth but eh. i think that she just went off to her castle 
Because we know she had her own little court and her own little castle. And I think her and her ladies just kind of sat around drinking champagne, playing cards, ordering dresses on Amazon. That like, sounds next. like a fabulous time. I think that's what she did. So, yeah. sadly, Joan died in 1437 at the age of 68. And in true fashion, she was given a great a lavish funeral and was buried next to Henry in Canterbury Cathedral, which me and Katie were talking about this right before we recorded. Um, typically, yeah. kings would be married to the wives that they had all their children with. Well, they'd and be buried in, next to Buried next to, excuse me, yeah. They would also be, be married to the wives that they had all the children with. <laughs> yeah, buried, not married. But uh, he was not buried next to his baby mama, um, his first wife. He was buried next to Joan. So that kind of can just give you a little clue of they really were head over they heels. Just, they just loved each other, and I think they just saw eye to eye on everything. It's reminding me very, very similar to the um, Agrippina and Germanicus sort yeah. of relationship and I as just, well. You know, letters from their qu- courtship or whatever survive, but there's not letters from their actual marriage that survived because they were always together. But I wish that um, I wish that they did survive so we could like kind of have a more like look into what a marriage of love was like between a king and a queen. Because that's very rare. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so Joan's reputation saw crazy highs <coughs> and crazy lows throughout her life. She's not even mentioned in the Henry the Fourth Shakespeare play. Which is insane to me, but whatever. She was mainly like a forgotten queen for a really long time. But now that things like um, the Wars of the Roses and the Hundred Years War are coming back into like popularity and like historical fiction, she started to have a bit of a, um, you know, reprieve in um, popular culture, which I think I think we're going to find out more about her in the next coming years. I really do. Yeah, and well-deserved, too. And I think she was smarter than a lot of people gave her credit for. Mm-hmm. And fucking, let's raise let's raise a glass of sparkling CBD oil water to our <laughs> town. Cheers, Cheers, Joan. All right, thanks, everyone, for listening. Love you guys. So thanks for listening. If there's something you want to hear, just like hit us up. You can email us at queenshistorypodcast at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter. We're at queens underscore podcast. We're on SoundCloud and Stitcher. And follow us on iTunes at Queens Podcast. All one word. All smushed up. Queens Podcast. Um, follow us on Facebook. Our intro music is by K Sparks featuring Beyond Belief. Thanks for letting us use your song, guys. Thanks, guys, for listening. Cheers. Bye, girl. Clink, clink. <laughs> Mwah.